is a balance, but I don't. And then folks online, can you confirm if you can hear us? We can hear you. All right, great. Thank you. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. I don't think we have a quorum. This is not going to be an option. Well, if, uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining online. There's online that does not appear that we have an official quorum. So um, and we're not going to have a meeting today. Um, I would ask if there's anybody online that would have something for the group they would like to talk about or add on to the next agenda. We, we can still we can still have the presentations and discussions. We just can't vote on anything. Yeah. Well, I, would it be fair to those that are presenting to present to nobody? <laughs> <laughs> And then to save it for the next meeting. I mean, I'd love to hear about the Louisa part of the presentation, but or, or, I guess Dylan's online, right? But, uh, I just, we've never experienced this in six years. So, um, well, we have, um, we have Dylan and Jim and uh, Carson on. Chuck is here as well. So we could at least go through the relevant information. Yes, I think that's a great idea. Okay. And everything will be recorded too. Members that want to watch this afterward. Okay. Have you also a recording? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you want to get us started? Yep. Um, to no, I don't believe there's anybody. My first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if this. Can we put put the presentation on. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know how to join the Zoom chat? You yeah, can join the Zoom see. meeting and then you can share. You should be able to share your screen yeah, through the Zoom. Go back to the main light. Or you can email it to me and I can share. I think I copied you on the email. I want to send it to Curtis. Yeah, I have it. I can try it. Right. Let me see if I sent this to everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Soon you can. Um, As part of the, uh, for this meeting, I was asked to present the PSI stuff. So um, we had the 2017 to 21 information before when we started Smart Scale. We just got the 2018 to 2022 data set in uh, end of November, beginning of December. So we put together this maps and uh, PSI list. And I'm basically going to present that. I also put in the projects that for Smart Scale that we're proposing for this round that we're working on. So I'll quickly go through these. You can go to the next slide. Um, the first one, this is the just PSI data. It's the potential for safety improvements. And it's basically the top crash locations in the district ranked by the total number of crashes. Um, we use this as a cursory way to identify where our, our serious locations are that we want to try to consider for improvements. Um, and we work with you guys on identifying those based on the, these lists. Um, and uh, they also are incorporated into the VTRANS needs. And those are, I think, going to be, our, we're supposed to be updated as of the, this month. So hopefully that's all taking place. Uh, next slide. So, well, we missed some. 
goes from there to Albemarle County. Okay. Albemarle County, I don't know if is anybody on from Albemarle County? Not yet. Okay. Um, this is the Almar County. We'll skip through this one. Nobody's here. Um Pluvanna. Is anybody here from Pluvanna? Online, yeah. Online. Okay. Oh, Dylan, no, um not Pluvanna. No, okay. Sorry, Dylan. Green, Green, Green County, Jim Friedel. There you go. Can you hear us, Jim? I can. I can hear you fine. <laughs> All right, Jim. Here's the updated information. Um Basically, we're looking at um, most of the intersections that we discussed before. I don't think there was anything really new. It's funny that um, the one intersection at Greencroft dropped off and Advanced Mills came on. So the project that we had planned will still be it will still work. Um, the rank dropped though to eighty four. So um, and then the other one, 607, jumped up. I saw that one. It's like 15th now. That's pretty high. So we probably need to... Actually, there was a crash there this morning. Oh, I wow. drove... Yeah, they had it. Uh, there was a rear end crash, I think, in the inside lane um, that I had to go through this morning. So, um, yeah, that one's problematic. Um, so those are the locations. And then the next ones are the segments. And then for you guys, uh, the next slide is the uh, projects we're looking at. We're doing the the advanced mill Greencroft intersections like we did last time, and then for resubmission and Carpenter's Mill Road resubmission. And Chuck, just for your knowledge, um, we're just doing the official confirmation. We have a resolution from the board that they will support these when they're ready for official submission. So any time okay. that you spend on it and we spend on it, staff won't be wasted. Okay. Um, like I said, we're going to review them and update them and get you the information uh, probably sometime in the next month, beginning of March, so you can actually put them into the uh, smart scale portal when it opens. Right. Perfect. Thank I you. I think uh, L and D's already are already looking at these. So um as soon as they get that information, we'll be working with you on those applications. Not as much to do this time because they don't have economic development. You guys, are you guys putting stuff into Virginia Scan? Uh, we haven't yet. No, we okay. need to. We need to add our economic development things into the scan, don't we? Yes. So whatever we can get in there, because that's they're going to pull directly from that when they do the. Uh, score the applications for environment uh, economic development. Okay, thank you. And then land use is back in after the CTB took it out in December. They put it back in as a multiplier. So it's not a, uh, still a factor, but it's not used like the other factors are, but it's used as a multiplier of the total score. Well, I'm sure that the changes they made will, will will certainly promote and help all the rural counties, just like every other year. Yeah, that's the way it's going to go. I agree. So, okay, that's all I have. You have any other questions? No, thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Louisa, Tom, here's your locations. Like I said, um, a lot of them are the same. Um, corner store Dickerson store still on and then 22 and 15 came back on it was on there before like we talked about and uh, before and then the um, Camp Creek is still the highest lo location and then 250 and 15 are the second and then I think uh, fourth is the 22 15 and then fifth would be the 208, 250, but it's way down the list. I think it dropped to, uh, I forget what the number was. Yeah, it went to 98, which is low. So um, the other ones would probably be the best locations. And like I said, for um, we can talk about do, looking at mineral. I know that one was something that Scott mentioned to me. Um, but I just don't have time to do it right now. But we can, I know it's been something, and I don't, even submitting it for small scale, I don't know how well it could be 
funded because you don't you're not only eligible for safety. So I don't even know if they would it, you could submit that as an eligible project. Yeah. Something to consider. Yeah. Are you guys still looking at DDAs? I know we had we've had this discussion every uh, night. The topic comes up and the conversation drops off. So at this time I would Okay. All right. Well, I'm just saying that that will give you guys some flexibility, especially in those growth areas for something besides safety projects. All right. Um, that's all I have for you guys. And I think the recommendations are what we had talked about before, the two intersections. Um, so just as soon as you let me know, that'd be great. Uh, I already have staff working on them to get them ready. Good. So um, thank you. Uh, somebody from Nelson on? Yeah. Oh, Rick and uh, Carson are back on as well. Do, oh, yeah. do, do you have anything to share, Rick or Carson? Sorry, I got multiple things going on. Um, I mean, based on the new regulations and guidelines, um, we've got the 151 corridor study going on. We'll more than likely prioritize two roundabout projects to support applications. Our traffic engineering, L&D, have already gone through the review process and are fine uh, supporting those projects moving forward. So it would just be those two projects on 151 for Nelson County? My assumption is they'll be the priority projects okay. from Nelson. Of course, Dylan may provide something different, but I'm pretty sure the Tannenbark um, roundabout project will be a priority project location. Yeah, I noticed one of those was pretty high. The one at uh, 29 and what is it, Route 6? Or 151 in Route 6 or 29 in Route 6? Uh, 151 in Route 6 was is a funded project, right? Oh, yeah, there's true. yeah, there's there's two six and one fifty one locations. One's a north, one's a south. Um, the south one is a funded, probably about sixteen million dollar project, which is under design now. The uh, northern one was an H SIP project probably about 10, 11 years ago but it's still showing up as a high priority PSI location. So we've got a roundabout project there and a roundabout project at Tanbark, which based on the public input and the survey results we got back, everybody seems to support pretty heavily. And then if Eric's here, if they wanna go back through <laughs> Almaro County. Almaro, yeah, you can do that. I think we we had a little bit of discussion at MPO Tech this morning. So, um, but basically, you guys have a lot. <laughs> Put it, and, and I will tell you from this from the start, this isn't all the locations. I I only put in the top fifty PSI locations. Um, there's probably twice as many. And for the segments, I only put in um, the rank in multiple different ways, but I only put in the top 100 locations. But there's many, many more than that also. So, um, yeah. And like I said, it's multiple pages worth of, of data. Here are all the locations. And if, if from the meeting this morning, the 29 North Corridor, is probably the worst location. Um, which has many, Tom many. One, I one hydraulic it's still hydraulic. My second is, I guess, profit sector for Road 29. Uh, no, it's, let's see. It is Woodbrook. Woodbrook. Um, number number two is eight eight sixty six. I don't remember which one that is. Um, number three is Woodbrook. Scroll down; it might be go up one page to back to the map. Oh, I see it's up there by and then in the set map. Three's on the right. One's at the bottom. I'm trying to find two.
it's that you come there. No, that's a segment. Okay. Um, Let's see. It. You can get out. To, I can't remember where 866 is. Um, but you have the top, many of the top locations in the in the district. Um, and I think we need to start, we'll probably have to start looking at the corridor again, these locations. I know Michael and I were, talk, had already started talking about it. So in the next, one of the next rounds of STARS or uh, pipeline is not enough. Yeah, we have too compressed. We have right now an application that hopefully is funded. Um, I'll find out, I think, sometime next month for the mm -hmm. DOT. So the connection between these neighborhoods grants yeah. that's from going from uh, Hilton Heights in the north to, I guess, the city. Yeah. Or just past the city county line, so I guess, in 215 and south. That's $200,000, I think, for yeah. planning. So hopefully that will at least give us a start on money to. We're going, I mean, that's looking at, I think they were, in, at least from what I can recall, they were, that were, focus of that was mainly on multimodal versus safety. It was, it was, yeah, looking at multimodal, but also ways for people like fast screens and bikes and stuff, yeah. safety, profiting that as well. So, I mean, I'm sure we'll have discussions of improvements that will make sure to also include multimodal things as well. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking some of the intersections, um, these numbers are crashes. Yeah. So that's my focus. It's going to be on yeah. what can we do to make it safer for people to get around those intersections because it's not pretty right now. So, um, so we may have to look at something along that corridor as well. Um, and that's pretty much it for Albemarle. Like I said, we've got the other locations, but it's going to look at this data. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, then, where is it available, the data? Huh? Where is it available on the website? I can send you this information. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, and then, Chuck, as far as how this data is used, so part of it is to identify eligible smart scale projects, but it, is this also what's used to identify your planning priority projects? We, it's incorporated into the VTrans. Okay. They haven't prioritized the VTrans needs. Okay. But they use the update the VTrans, and that's what they're doing this month. This should be out this month, the updated VTrans need with this data. Okay. Here. So, Sandy, um, one of the other components with the PSI is typically the traffic engineering section, as I know in our district, they will pull upwards to 100 locations. Okay. And do an individual study, what we kind of call, pretty much call like mini uh, roadway safety audit okay. locations. And we may have one or two of those projects that pop up to be potential smart scale, but typically they're handled on their maintenance and operations funding or HSIP or different programs like that. So sometimes local government entities won't have to go through any application phases. Some of that work will be completed as part of the normal day to day routine stuff. You know, ours do the same thing. Okay. A lot of times for the projects that they can't do with HSIP, they'll let me know what the locations are and re yeah. recommendations, and then we will we'll look at that. Plank Road is one of the ones in Almar County that had, they actually studied for an ARCA. Um, and that's one of the ones they're looking at submitting. So we're going to use that study that Cal Engineering did. Um, I mean, that's pretty much all I had. So. Of, course, of course, Chuck, I missed the front end. I was tied up with something else. I'm sure you told everybody that don't bring anything new to the table from this point on, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> We're, we've got them all defined uh, at this point. I've been trying to coordinate that early on. Tom and I were just having that discussion earlier. So, um, but yeah, we are got emails from a couple of different people saying no more. Yep. <laughs> Well, fortunately, we're not too bad of shape. We've only got like 20 locations at this point versus 38 which from last time. Yeah, I think your district and my district, we've been the two status quo at about 28 to 32 projects every round. 
I think we're sitting at 16 right now with the potential of four additional coming from pipeline or current studies that are That's, underway. Yeah, we're looking at, at uh, four pipelines projects also. Yep. Actually, more than that. Because the NPA might submit some, the county might submit some, plus I got some up north in the same boat. So, but it's right around 20 applications to it, even if I count those. And for the local government entities, MPOs, um, it's going to be even more of a chess game this round to maximize high priority fundings and, you know, those kind of systemic corridor projects that you're going to have to submit as a total package. Yeah. Yeah, we've had that discussion and we're looking at, uh, and were you on the call last week with Angel? Yeah, sadly, yes. Yeah, no, that was pretty horrible. Um, and I was really, we have two projects, both our pipelines projects in Albemarle have interchanges on them. So, uh, and that's, they're going to be hard for us to get the data and the, and the paperwork documentation in, in time enough to make the gates that they're setting for us to try to meet this one. Which... Yeah. Yeah. If your OSAR is not anywhere near, then you're, you're not going to make it through. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what, well, we're going to get to that. It's just a matter of, do we have to do phase two or just phase one? If we have to do just the alternatives analysis, then I think we can probably get to that and get a preferred alternative. But that's about it. Um, if we have to do anything beyond that, it's going to be difficult. Well, I did see they came out with the technical manual was out today, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody should have gotten an email yesterday or today from uh, Office of Intermodal Planning. Yeah. Probably the most detailed email I've seen sent out as far as information. Definitely get in there and start reading all that um, so that you understand, you know, the process moving forward. And some ways it's going to be much easier on you. Other ways, you know, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But it's going to be an even bigger partnership between VDOT and the local governments this time around, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, there's also a, if you don't have it on your calendars, uh, there's also a training that's scheduled for February 28th. Uh, so, yeah. Speaking of which, we can go ahead and just talk about, I think you all are aware at this point of what the proposed changes are. Or what the changes now are. They're not proposed anymore. They actual changes so but just real briefly so that um i'll go through what the difference we are from round uh the previous round round five the biggest the biggest um changes that are going to be very direct are not going to affect local projects or projects that are local through the or, or the Lynchburg district funding program but are what are eligible to receive funding through the high priority program so localities are still eligible to submit projects that can be um, funded through the high priority program, but they can also submit projects funded through the district grant programs. MPOs, transit agencies, and um, PDCs are only eligible to submit projects through the high priority program though. So when they added these eligibility criteria for the high priority program, what this means is it limits the types of projects that MPOs, PDCs, and transit agencies can submit to just this list. And then um, any local projects or projects that are submitted by the localities, if they meet this criteria, could also be eligible for the high quality program. One of the reasons that this is a little bit important is because the um, funding, the amount of total funding for the Cold Pepper District and the local district is, um, for the Cold Pepper District, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, around $26 million. And then, is that? Is that oh, I, I, I thought that was what when I looked at no, it. That was what my I, last slide was. Your last slide. Sorry. Is that 120? Yeah. 120. 126 million. Yeah. I looked at it recently. Which is high. That can't I, be right. And, and, <laughs> and the reason for that is um, we don't have any interstate. Mm -hmm. I mean, 64 and 66 are go through the district, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of, of money going to those corridors right. from our district. So right. it, that money rolls into the district grant fund. Okay. 
I must have either looked at it wrong or there was a typo on the slide that looked because I looked at that. That could not be correct. All right. But but the the point is that if you have like a $40 million project, that's going to eat up a large portion of that district grant program budget. And so um, it is helpful to know what types of projects might be eligible for the high priority program. So before projects that were eligible for the high priority program were just based on where the project was located, either in a corridor or statewide significance or in a regional network, which were largely related to the MPOs. They still have to meet that criteria, but now they also are limited to one of these types of projects, which are largely focused on new capacity projects, adding lanes, adding new road alignments, improving interchanges, um, significant improvements to uh, transit and freight movements. And then in yellow, they added this um, entire corridor improvement, identified as preferred alternatives of STARS, pipeline studies, or another MPA study in coordination with the state. So what this means is that if you have a project pipeline or star study that you work on and you identify a set of um, preferred alternatives, if you submit an application for all of those alternatives combined in one application, those would be eligible through the high priority But you have to submit all of them. Otherwise, at the localities, you can pull out sections of any one of those studies and submit just those applications through the district grant program. Um, the other thing that occurred is that there are some modifications to the um, to the weighting factors. And so for the MPO area, that's type B. And then for all of the areas within the TJPDC area outside of the MPO, that's area type C. So this is going to be the weighting criteria that are going to be used to evaluate your smart scale projects. This was bumped up 30% of your benefit points will come from safety. So any of those safety air target areas are going to be a large percentage of your score. Congestion is 20%, accessibility is 15%. Economic development is 25%. So again, um, it's really important that you are entering all of your economic development information into the Virginia CS database because economic development is going to be 25% of your score. And then um, environmental considerations are 10%. The land use was converted to a multiplier. So basically your benefits are going to be assessed over these other five scoring criteria. And then um, if you have identified land use benefits, those are going to be uh, multiplied to uh, increase your baseline points and all of those other factors. So, um, so and then as Chuck said, there are also procedural changes. Um, so it's going to be really important that we are all working proactively, not just through this cycle, but through future cycles to identify projects with enough time to make sure that we can meet all of those um, application requirements. One thing that we heard very loud and clear through all of the CTB meetings is that they were going to, because they did not change the um, number of applications each entity is able to submit, they're going to enforce the application completeness requirements pretty, um, pretty stringently. So that means that whereas previously we had opportunities if we were missing one or two analyses or a letter of resolution or anything like that, there was some flexibility to add that after the application deadline and it doesn't mm -hmm. sound like that flexibility will be extended moving forward. And that's in order to try to um, keep the application process moving efficiently and to um, relieve some of the um, some of the pressure on all of the staff that are involved with the validation of review and scoring. There was a lot of discussion last week about actually making changes after the pre application period. Okay. And um, I think it opens it back up for most of the criteria, but uploading some of the documentation and actually making changes, they're not sure if we're even there actually going to be able to do it. And whether not only you guys might be able to do it, but whether we can do it. Mm -hmm. So that could. Um, we're gonna get find out what they weren't sure last week, so more to come on that. Uh, but it's gonna be critical to get those critical documents in as by March, end of March, and that's what my concern is. Yeah, the the big takeaway if you're able to clone an application that was made it through Smart Scale last year, go ahead and do that as quickly as you can. 
cost estimates don't have to be finalized through the pre-app phase. I got that solidified today. No new cost estimate workbook for the pre-app, but all of that will be necessary for the final application as it always has. And then I also saw that the uh, pre-scoping module, which is basically a place where you can start entering the information before the applications are open, are um, being encouraged to be used. I think, do, do you know, Rick or Chad, can you clone applications into the pre-scoping portal or does that just create an extra step that is unnecessary? You can, but you don't have to. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say if you've got a pre-app, don't worry about the pre-scoping. Just okay. clone to the application once the portal opens for March first. Yeah, if you have a if you have a if you're rolling an existing application over, I would just clone it into the into the new application, not the pre-screening. Okay. If the way the pre-screening module works is, we can actually edit it. Mm -hmm. Live. Okay. And then what happens is we review it and we have to say, yeah, it's it's ready. And then you can clone it into the application. Application. Okay. So you might as well just if you haven't started it already, you can start it in there and then you could roll it over, but it just adds another layer of review on our part to actually do it. Or if you want to collaborate on an application, we can do that during okay. that process. But it's usually, it gives you the opportunity to work on applications throughout the year as opposed to waiting until pre-application period opens. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that covers all of the most important topics, but um, yeah, it's, it's just going to be important that everybody's paying attention. And also the pre-applications we confirm, they're going to open on March 1st. They're going to need to be submitted April 1st. So you have a month. It's the application window opens. You do not need resolutions of support from your governing bodies during the pre-application. You will need those for the final applications. And you can't have them later. That's one of the things they were really strict on. We can't submit any documentation after all the source. Any other questions on work skill? No, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I got confirmation 522. Uh, sorry, 2215. Cool. What was that report you said from the week? Well, it came out recently. Yeah, back from the Yeah, so there was a report. Technical guide? Yeah, the guide. Yeah. They just emailed it out. It went out as a mass email to all the people that have. Smart scale. Yeah, it's also on the smart scale, scale web page. It's on the smart scale web page today. Okay. So I don't know. Have you gotten smart scale access yet? I have it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, what is the best way to get into the use of app? Right. I can't remember the web address. The economic development department okay. should be able to support that if they. Have questions. I don't know if there's a point of contact. Go to the VDEP website that's on that website. I want to ask out for general in case anybody was curious. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Do you have any additional smart skill updates about the next island? That I just said. Do you want to do a round table or before we go to the round table? Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, uh, we are the um, State Planning Commission has recommended the facilities plans, which are going to be in addition to our 2040 comprehensive plan of the board supervising for review. Um, and I think it will be, it will be another good year here for Volusia County. That's all I have for today. Um, we're working on um, and then the oral assessment. Um, uh, we're going to be April tomorrow, and then next week is Nancy. We're going to talk about kind of what 
they want transportation wise, something like that, and then also they've been working on the secondary six year plan. So there are six roads in the county that, if we get enough approval from residents on the road, will be paved. So that's sending for them. And I get a lot of emails in the next few weeks. So that's all we have right now. Thanks. Anybody from the other side? Yeah, um, just a couple things, but they're big things, I reckon. We've got our comp plan public hearings coming up. So our planning commission public hearing will be at the high school on the 31st at the end of the month. And then we've scheduled our board hearing for March. So just taking our time through this and then uh, we just got our first utility scale solar application um, since we've adopted the ordinance a few years ago. So looking forward to navigating through that, but that's all I've got right now. <laughs> Chuck or Rick or Carson, do you guys have any other updates? Um, we're just con continuing to work on the four pipeline studies um, and the three star studies I got going on. Um, as well as all the smart scale applications. So, busy. A couple of things. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I'll share, uh, we're getting into the last phase of our 151 corridor study. We've had pretty robust participation in our public meetings. Anybody that knows that corridor in the community there uh, can always expect a lot of participants. Um, just to give you some stats, on the recently closed survey, uh, over 829 participants, 3, 000, almost 4,000 views on the survey, close to 7,000 responses, and over 1,000 specific comments. So the survey, the online surveys that we're doing now with the studies um, are extremely valuable. And, you know, Participate. Uh, appreciate everybody's, you know, Nelson County, Sandy, the PDC, and posting that information out and getting it through the social media feeds. Even in our pipeline studies, these uh, the new public input uh, process that we're utilizing is just gangbusters as far as getting people involved. So that's a it's a it's a real big positive that our consultants are really um, showing some appreciation for. Yeah. I was going to say, I chime in. We had a public meeting for one of our source studies. I had two people show up, but we had probably 700 people respond on, to the survey. Chuck, when we have our next uh, 151 corridor, I'll invite you. And you, can, <laughs> you. You can handle and talk to one of the 130 to 140 people that show up on a regular basis. Yeah. That's always yeah. Sarah, do you have any updates? <laughs> anything else from the PDC or do you want to share anything about safe shoots for all journeys? Yeah, we are working on drafting the letters of commitment for each of the jurisdictions right now. So if you haven't heard from us yet, keep an eye out. We'll probably be discussing it all with you in the coming weeks and presenting to your boards mm -hmm. shortly thereafter. So just keep an eye out. Great. Yep. Sorry, I actually have a follow-up question looking at my notes here for smart scale. What is the distance around an intersection that you have that you can put economic development into these scanners? Or I remember there being like a limitation in the past. It's still you know, those are still the criteria is still there. Depending on the type of intersection, it goes out a um, quarter mile for pet pedestrian, half mile, and I think one mile for uh, you know, three miles. Three miles. Yeah. Three miles for interchange. And the interchange being interstate interchange or just interchange? Interchange. Okay. Interchange, not intersection. Okay. So roundabouts fall under the one mile. That's listed in detail in the technical guide. It is in the technical guide. Yeah, none of that changed. All it's all they're going to do is they're going to import the layer 
from these uh, Virginia scans okay. in, and then they're going to basically, based on the what's in that ever in those that distance from the project site, that's what they'll pull in, and then run the normal score. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the group? Well, I appreciate all of you that, uh, that joined us here online and in person. I don't believe anybody from the public joined us, so I will go ahead and motion to adjourn uh, the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. No. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Curtis, Curtis, I haven't forgot about you. I'm putting together some best practices for corridor overlays. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. Yep. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. That was good. Yeah. <laughs>